personas can also help us deal with a number of user-centered design issues that are actually pretty common. Now, there is a whole list that I can talk about, but I'm just going to talk about a few. And I will tell you that these actually are pretty common. They're ones that I have experienced myself when I've worked out in industry. And they really are a great argument, especially once you have that experience of why you'd really do want a persona, or actually a number of personas. All right, the first is the elastic user. Has anyone heard of the elastic user? No? Can anyone imagine what I mean by the elastic user? A little louder again. So you think of someone who gets used to anything. What do you think? Could be someone open-minded. Do you think that, that would be a, a, an issue with, a, uh, with user design? No, I'd love for all my users to be uh, very flexible and can get used to anything and open-minded. That'd be pretty awesome. How many people are like that? Yeah, not so much. Except for us, of course. Because we're awesome. All right, so what an elastic user is, is basically a user that is like, kind of like Gumby. You guys know Gumby? You don't know Gumby? Okay, some of you, okay, some of you do, some of you don't. Okay, so Gumby is this funky little, he's what, green, right? This little green guy who's made of rubber or you take them and you stretch them out like this, and you can stretch them in all sorts of directions, and you let go, and then he pops back and whacks you in the face. Because he's rubber, and you're not supposed to pull him like that. Well, that's the same idea with an elastic user. An elastic user is basically where you have a design team where various members of the design team have different ideas of who your user is. So they're grabbing their arm and their leg, and they're pulling them in a different direction so that they fit what they feel or what they believe your typical user is. But when that happens then, well, the same thing happens when you're pulling Gumby apart and you let go of him. Ultimately, down the road, you're going to have problems with your design. Some will say the design is going to end up smacking you in the face because now you have a design team that has designed a product for a user that doesn't exist because everyone had a different idea of who that user is. And, in fact, that user may even evolve and change over time. So who you're initially designing for may change six months later down the road. Because who remembers, if you don't have it documented in some way, who remembers who you think your user was at the very beginning if it's now six months down the road? Not so much. And different people will remember things differently. How many of you have ever taken one of these psychology courses where they start with a sentence and they have someone whisper it to someone else and then you kind of go through the entire class? You no know longer have it in writing and you have to tell the person next to you what you were just told. Have any of you experienced that? Yeah, it's, an it's an actual game? Telephone, Telephone something? Yeah, it might be. So, by the time you get to the last person, and this is usually in a span of a whole five minutes, how close is what that person says to the original sentence? Yeah, not so much. You're lucky if it even is in the same domain. Now, so imagine that's five minutes and say 30 people. Your team can be 30 people long and now it's six months later. What do you think? Problem? Could be. All right, then there is also self-referential design. This is something we've actually talked about already in class numerous times. And this is basically where we as designers start projecting our goals and our skills and our capabilities onto a product's design. Such as the example that I had previously given you with the uh, developers of, do you remember what? At Microsoft? A Visual Studio. All right, they were projecting their own goals and their own capabilities 
into the design of the product. And of course, since they are the cream of the crop, how well does that work for your average programmer? Not so well. Then there are design edge cases. Now with design edge cases, this is basically where you're thinking about, okay, I'm going to design this, and then you think, wait a minute, the user might make this mistake. So I'm going to make sure that in the design it takes care of this. Oh wait, and they might make this mistake, so I'm going to do this too. And this mistake, I can do this too. And you end up forgetting about your target persona, where you are thinking about not who your primary persona is, your primary user is, but you're thinking of all the exceptions, and you design for those exceptions. Now, I'm actually going to give you an example of this that I think you can relate to a little bit more, at least some of you, in the world of HR, human resources. How many of you have ever worked at a company where they start off where they are very generous and very relaxed about their leave policies, for example, their sick leave policies. So if you're sick, okay, you know, you just have to, you know, call in, make sure you call in and let us know. And then all of a sudden, here comes an employee that takes advantage of the policy and the company suddenly decides if you miss one day of work, you want to get paid, you must bring a doctor's note. Anyone experienced that or heard of it? I actually have experienced that. So in that case, who are they basing their design of their policy on? Is it on most of the employees or the one exception? The one exception. Now, how well do you think that works for your typical employee? Not so much. Right, so if you have a virus, you know it's a virus, you're not feeling well, you want to get paid, what do you have to do? You have to go to the doctor so they can tell you, you have a virus. Thank you for coming to see me. Pay me 60 bucks or 120 bucks. Thank you very much. Here's your note for work. Not such a good idea. Same thing when we're talking about the design of products. Yes. So, um, how do you handle those exceptions, but we, you know, <coughs> Well, one of the things you need to, to make sure that you are doing is doing some research to see, you know, how often does this happen? Now, this is also one way, reason why we have things like informative or hopefully informative error messages, for example. And sometimes it may be that Depending on the design, you may just have to put in an error message or you may have to put some constraints on a capability. But you want to make sure that your primary design is still for your primary users. And when it comes to some of these edge cases, you really want to try to look at the severity as well as the likelihood that this is going to be a problem. And you also have to remember, you can't create a product that will satisfy everyone's needs. It's just not possible. And sometimes you just have to realize that an edge case is something that you can't really deal with in your design. And that's also another perfectly viable option. As long as you've done your research and you're fully aware that it is an, ed you know, an edge case and not your typical user. Does that help at all? All right, now, another thing that people sometimes get confused about is when they look at personas, they just see personas as roles. Right? And there is a lot of overlap, which is why it can be so confusing. But you want to remember, personas and roles are not necessarily the same. They can be the same, but it is also entirely feasible that they are not. So you want to make sure that you make that differentiation. So. Let's look at a couple of examples, right? Parents. A lot of people think of parents as a role, right? You're a parent. Now, here's where I want you to think about it in terms of a persona versus a role. Do you think that a parent of 
one child or two, child, two children is the same as a parent of eight children. Think it's the same? Not so much. In fact, there are people who argue the difference between one child and two, two children is exponential. Now think eight. So in that case, you can't just use a rule. You can't just say this is a parent. You actually have to think about your user. Is this a parent who has a couple of kids or a parent who has many children? Is that going to have an effect on your design? Let's look at uh, doctors. Right? That's a role. Now let's look at two different kinds of doctors. Let's say an oncologist versus a podiatrist. Do you know what an oncologist is? Yeah, the oncologist is, is a doctor that focuses on cancer. And a podiatrist, do you know what a podiatrist is? Foot doctor. Right, we have problems with your footsies. Now, if you are designing a product that can help doctors, specifically cancer doctors, oncologists, be able to communicate and have build a relationship with their patients in a more positive manner, do you think that you would have the same design as if you were trying to build a system that would work for a podiatrist? Probably not. Two very different realms dealing with very different issues. So again, in that case, you can't just say it's a role, this is a doctor, you have to look at the particular persona and what their goals are. Then um, there's programmers, right? New programmers versus experienced programmers. Think you're going to design things differently? You probably will if you are focusing just on something for new programmers. Make sense? See the difference? Great exam question, by the way. Now, remember a few slides back, we talked about our beautiful, wonderful examples that fit stereotypes so well? Remember I said you shouldn't use stereotypes? Well, guess what? You shouldn't use stereotypes. Now, one of the things I want to point out, point out though, is that even though this author, very smart, very talented, tells you not to use stereotypes, right? Still, did use stereotypes, we have a tendency to use stereotypes. And it can be hard to stop. But that's why we want to be very cognizant of it. Because in fact, the best way to stop using stereotypes is to realize you're using stereotypes. There are a lot of times where we may not have access to user research. So research on our actual users. So we only have our ideas of what we think a particular user is like. When there is uncertainty, we have a tendency to fall back on our stereotypes, on what we think of who our, of who our users are. And that can really be a mistake. Because one of the things that we find is that although you can always find people that will fit the stereotypes, the majority of people don't. So the majority of women do not fit the stereotype that we have of women in Western society. Goodwin really actually came up with a very nice quote, I think, when it comes to thinking about personas and stereotypes. The whole point in creating personas is to get past our personal opinions and presumptions because we want to find out who our users really are. So when you are creating your personas, especially when there's uncertainty, one of the things you absolutely really should check for is to make sure that you have not just created a stereotype. Okay, let me take a stereotype that we all, as technology people, can associate with. What is the typical stereotype of a computer person? A little louder. Geeky, has no social life. What else? <laughs> Wearing thick, was it bottle cap rimmed glasses? Has bad hair? 
hides behind their computer, doesn't talk to anyone, is a super genius. Now, of course, we are super geniuses in here, right? Who in here actually fits that stereotype? I don't think anyone in this room fits that stereotype. Right? I don't see anyone who fits it. So, um, well, if we, if we walk out into the world, can we find one, someone who fits it? We probably could. But think about it. Here we have a room of what? How many people are in this class? 20 some odd people? Just one. Wait, just one? You're telling me I fit the stereotype of a nerd? No, just kidding. Now, if we decided we were going to design something for your stereotypical computer person, do you think we're going to end up with a product that we, the real computer people, are going to want to use? Yeah, probably not. So, think it's a good idea? Nope. I told you about my, my example with uh, my grandmother and old people, right? Our idea of old people and how much trouble I got into. Yeah, you'll get into just as much trouble. Have I convinced you not to use stereotypes? Some of you are like, yeah, you're like, yeah, maybe for anyone that's not a, you know. Yes? Sometimes uh, wouldn't stereotypes uh, work in certain situations, like, uh, for example, uh, thinking of games or something? Games is a really, really interesting area. A lot of people, what do you think of gamers? Who do you think gamers are? <laughs> Mostly male. Uh, teenagers. Teenagers. No, no wife. Uh, <laughs> You're in your parents' basement. We don't have basements here, but. They're not good at sports. They don't practice sports. They're not good at sports. They don't practice sports. They drink a lot of Mountain Dew. They drink a lot of Mountain Dew. <laughs> right? Who knows what the reality is about gamers these days? They're like middle, not middle age, but like between like 20. 20 to like, 20, like between 20 and 30, you don't have to, um, uh, like The average, I think, is between 28 and 45. Yeah, yeah. something like that. What about gender? Are there more male or female gamers? Recently, there are more females. Uh, there are more females out there. Now there are more female gamers. So that actually is a great example. And a lot of times people think, yeah, gamers. Oh, wait. You have to really think about it, though, because even you knew that, right? Because you're giving me some of the answers. Now, of course, I never fall into the trap of stereotypes. I'm just kidding. Even I fall into it. Oh, there's one more thing about stereotypes that I want to mention. There's something that's called stereotype threat. Has any of you heard of it? All right, so stereotype threat is really interesting because it can have an effect on how we interact with people and also interact with technology. Stereotype threat is basically, we all have knowledge of stereotypes, right? A lot of them are negative. Stereotype threat is where we end up in a situation where we are somehow unconsciously, actually, or even consciously, reminded that we are a member of the group that is stereotyped. And what happens? Well, without knowing it, it dramatically affects the way we behave. Most of the research in this actually looks at performance. So women in math, women in computing, African Americans, I'm sorry, in my, we're in Miami, blacks and whites when it comes to some, those, some people from the uh, islands have told me I am not African American. That's why I change. <laughs> All right, so blacks and, and whites when it comes to computing, when it comes to math. Where, here's an example. There are a number of studies, they've done this both with women and both with, uh, with blacks, where they will have a room full of Caucasian males. Right? Where? 
either a woman or someone who is black comes in to take a math test or comes in to take a test on their knowledge of technology. They subconsciously notice the difference that this is a bunch of white guys. And you know what? They perform more poorly just because of that. Now, by the way, white males are not immune. They've also done this study with sports. And white men and black men, white men have the same problem. They can't perform well. So it's all human. Now, where does this take us when it comes to design? If we look back at gaming, for example, you can create an environment that is stereotypically, say, predominantly male. <coughs> that can change how people use the product and are able to effectively accomplish their goals with the product because of stereotype threat. It's very insidious. It's very subtle, but has a very strong effect. But there is one very easy way to combat stereotype threat, where you can extinguish it. Anyone want to take a guess? You be, sorry, go ahead. No, I was like, I, it wasn't the right answer. <laughs> you just remind yourself that stereotype threat exists. You are aware of it. You're like, oh. Oh, stereotype threats. Now what you find is that whoever happens to be in the minority in that case, all of these differences in performance now disappear. But that's also why we want to think about how we design things. We do not want to design things in a way that is going to engage some sort of stereotype threat. So if you're designing a game, that you want everyone to use, that you want the majority of, you, of gamers to use, you want to be very careful about what types of things you put into that game that may engender stereotype threat unnecessarily. Make sense? Okay. <clears throat>